Okay, in the last lecture video, we looked at the difference between a conjugated diene and an isolated diene. And what we're going to find is that isolated dienes, the double bonds react independent of each other. And so what that means is if I reacted this isolated diene with two equivalents of HCl, that each HCl would add independently to the double bond. So I would add Markovnikov addition of HCl to the two double bonds. But when I add HCl to the conjugated system, I'm going to end up with a slightly different reaction. And so we'll talk about that. So conjugated dienes react differently than isolated ones. In terms of getting to that point, though, let's talk a little bit about the reactions of these um, or a little bit about the allylic position. We need to understand the allylic position before we talk about the conjugated diene reactions. And so the allylic position is this position. It's this carbon that is next to the double bond. That is the allylic position. And the allylic position then is special. The actual carbons that are in the double bond those are called the vanillic carbons. So when you react an, an allylic um, molecule with an allylic carbon in free radical halogenation, we're going to find that the free radical ends up forming at the allylic carbon, um, and you brominate exclusively at the allylic position. Why? Because the allylic position is special from this standpoint. If you have a free radical next to the double bond, what you end up being able to do is, if I split this double bond and I gave each one of those um, carbons one electron from that double bond, the middle carbon could pair up with the unpaired electron on the CH2 group and we would come over here and we would form our double bond along with our allylic radical then on the other carbon. And that then, the resonance hybrid of this would look like this. We would have a CH2 with the CH in the middle and then a CH2 on the end. We would have partial double bonds here. And then I'm going to do something that I will only do one time, and that is to sort of write, we would have a partial unpaired electron on each one of those two carbons. That's sort of what you could think of the resonance hybrid would look like. So the idea here is that the more resonance structures I can draw, the more stable the overall molecule. So while this looks like a primary radical, this one is actually more stable because it's primary allylic. Now, there is a problem here, and the problem is that if I tried to free radically halogenate at this allylic position using Br2 and light, I wouldn't get that product. Because thinking about this, if, if I took that molecule and I said, well, let's add Br2 to that, and I forget about the light, what would you write as the major product of that reaction? Well, you would say, oh, that's an alkene plus bromine, that means that I'm going to add two BRs, 100% trans. Whether the light is there or not is irrelevant because bromine reacts readily with a double bond, so we wouldn't actually have a free radical reaction. We would just have an alkene addition. So in terms of this reaction, then, we wouldn't get this product. We would get the dibromo compound. So how do you do free radical halogenation if you want to free radically halogenate at the allylic position? Well, then what you need to use is you need to use a reagent called NBS, 
which stands for N-bromosuccinamid. When you heat NBS, when it is heated, it forms a Br dot. It basically forms a bromine atom. It doesn't form molecular bromine so that you don't have to worry about adding to the double bond. It only will form a bromine atom that will abstract the hydrogen from the allylic position to make the free radical reaction go. So if you want to accomplish this reaction, you would use NBS and heat, not Br2 and light. That will not work. You can use NBS to do other free radical halogenation reactions of alkanes as well if you, if you wanted to. So that's one of the complications of trying to free radically halogenate is we need a new reagent to be able to do that. Now, in terms of the allylic carbocation, if we change and go from a radical to a carbocation, if you look at this structure, you might say, wait, you just drew a primary carbocation. Uh, yes, but I wrote a primary allylic carbocation. And there's another resonance structure I could draw for this primary allylic carbocation by taking this pair of electrons and moving it over to then form the double bond here. And then the plus charge would go on this carbon. The more resonance structures you can draw, the more stable the molecule is. And so this is going to be more stable than a primary carbocation, and actually this will form. Now, what's the resonance hybrid going to look like? We're going to have a partial double bond between each of the two carbons. And the positive charge is going to be split between the two end carbons. So we're going to have delta positive charges there. And so this would be our resonance hybrid. So the allylic position then is special. Carbocations that are formed there can have another resonance structure. And we can delocalize the charge and move the carbocation over to the other carbon position. Now looking at the structure of an allylic carbocation, all of the carbons in that allylic carbocation are sp2 hybridized, which means that they would have p orbitals that are all parallel to each other, sort of like what we saw with the conjugated diene in the last lecture video. And so what happens is if they can all overlap in the resonance hybrid, this is just one of the two resonance structures. Right, the other one would look like this, where I would have the positive charge here, and I would have the double bond there. So these were my two resonance structures. And what would really happen is we would delocalize all of the p orbitals, and we would have delta positive charges on each of the two carbons, and then partial double bonds between the car in the carbon-carbon bonds. So allylic carbocations then are stabilized by resonance. And that's important to remember because they're going to play a role in our reactions of these um, different allylic and conjugated systems. So here's just a picture of that to show that in terms of these p orbitals in the resonance hybrid we had partial double bonds here and we had delta positives on each of the ends this is what's called a charge distribution diagram the blue is delta positive charge and so you can see that the two end carbons are sharing in this case equally they're sharing the delta positive um, charges we'll see in a few minutes that depending on whether this carbon is primary, secondary, or tertiary, it may take on more of the delta positive charge depending on how it's substituted. Okay. So in terms of the reaction of an allylic carbocation, let's take a picture here. And let me just grab an empty slide and 
move it. Okay, so let's say that I took this molecule and I had a Br on this and I reacted it with H2O. And I said, let's do the reaction mechanism for this reaction. Well, the first thing we would do is we would see, okay, this is a primary allylic bromide, and this is a weak nucleophile. What kinds of reactions can the weak nucleophile undergo? They have to undergo SN1. SN1 reactions can only occur by a carbocation intermediate, can this primary allylic halide form a, a carbocation? Yes, one that's stabilized by resonance. So I would break the carbon bromine bond. I would form my carbocation. And now I would have a second resonance structure that I could draw for that carbocation. And of course, the resonance hybrid for this would have partial double bonds and then partial charges on the two ends. So that would be my resonance hybrid. So an allylic bromide can undergo SN1. And the question is, how do we write the second part of this mechanism? And there's a couple ways that we can do that. First, this is, remember, this resonance hybrid, the resonance hybrid is the true structure of that carbocation intermediate. And so if we really wanted to draw the true mechanism, we would have our nucleophile, in this case this would be our Br minus, add to the carbon on the right, and add to the carbon on the left so that we would get these two products. Now these two products are exactly the same, right? Because they're both basically double bond with the bromine in this case attached to CH2. So they're identical products, but they come about by reacting the bromine with two different carbons. Now one of the problems here is when you add the nucleophile or the bromine to one carbon, the double bond goes to the other carbon and it sometimes reacting the resonance hybrid can be kind of confusing. So despite the fact that this is the true structure, we're going to react each resonance structure as if it was the true intermediate. So in other words, if I take my nucleophile and add to this carbocation resonance structure, I'll get this product. If I add the nucleophile to this carbocation intermediate, I'm going to get this product. And so, despite the fact that the true intermediate is the resonance hybrid, we're going to react each resonance structure with the nucleophile to write the products. It just makes it a little bit easier to know where the double bond goes. Okay. Now, to sort of set the stage here for the reactions of conjugated dienes, let's make this a little bit more complicated. Let's say I reacted that alkyl, that allylic bromide now with this water molecule. And so we know that this has to be an SN1 mechanism because that's all weak nucleophiles can undergo. So the first step in the mechanism is to break the carbon bromine bond. And if I do that, I'm going to form this carbocation right, and a Br minus. Then I'm going to take this pair of electrons and move it here to form now my double bond and my positive charge here. So now I have my two resonance structures and now what would I do? Well now I would add my H2O to this carbocation I would add my H2O to this carbocation. Now I'm going to write the complete mechanism here, just like you would. We're going to have the oxonium ion. 
And over here, we're going to have this oxonium ion formed and then the water or the Br minus as this pair of electrons goes to form the neutral oxygen atom because it's got lone pairs then the water is going to be there to catch it. So the final product here will look like this. We'll have our OH there and then down here same thing our water molecule catches the H plus as this pair of electrons moves to the oxygen. To form that product. Okay. Now let's call this product A and let's call this product B. I'm going to ask you a question and the video will stop and you can go ahead and give me your answer. Um, for the moment there is no right or wrong answer here and actually not even for the moment there is no right or wrong answer. So which product, we made two products here, which one is the major product? Which one do you think? Do you think A or B is the major product of this reaction? And this is kind of like a poll question. If we were face to face in a lecture, I would ask everybody to give me their thoughts on which one of these two products was the major product. So which one do you think is the major product? And in your own mind, why? Why did you choose that? Do you have a reason or is it just a guess? So go ahead and tell me what's the major product of this reaction, A or B? Okay, well, I could argue this reaction both ways. And let me do that. So in class, what I would do is I would say, hey, um, somebody who chose A, give me a reason for choosing A. Somebody who chose B, give me a reason for choosing B. And so let's make an argument here. So if you chose B, why did you choose B? Well, what most people will tell me is if you chose B as your major product, you would say, well, that's because this is a secondary carbocation versus what kind of carbocation here, primary. And I know secondary carbocation is more stable, and we've done reactions where the major product comes from the more stable intermediate. And that's what this is, right? This is the more stable intermediate. Now, I know that the true intermediate is the resonance hybrid, but of these two resonance structures, this is the more stable one. So you could make an argument, oh, the major product comes from the more stable intermediate. Markovnikov's addition, we did that. If you chose A, why would you choose A? And people will usually tell me, well, because compared this double bond, compared to this double bond, this is the more stable product. It's the more stable double bond because it's more substituted. And we've done reactions where we formed the more stable product. So which one is it? Is it the more stable intermediate that gives you the major product, or is it the more stable product that gives you the intermediate? And the answer is it depends, which isn't really a good answer. And you're going to say, well, what does it depend on? And we'll get to that in a moment. So we'll come back to this and determine which one of these two is the major product of the reaction, but it's going to depend. Okay, so why is why am I showing you this? Well, because when we react a conjugated diene with something like HBr, our first step in the mechanism is going to be to add the H plus to one of the end carbons in the diene. 
Now, if I like to number these one, two, three, and four. So we always either add to carbon one or carbon four in this case. And I should probably rearrange this and say the way I've drawn it in this slide, let's, let's number one, two, three, and four that way. So let me go ahead and get rid of those numbers. So I'm going to add the H plus to carbon one. And when I do that, what do I end up doing? I end up making this carbocation. It's an allylic carbocation, so then I can take this pair of electrons, move it here, and I can form the second resonance structure of the allylic carbocation. And now my Br minus can come in and add to this carbon. And what kind of carbocation is that? That is a secondary allylic carbocation. Or the Br minus can come over here and add to this carbocation. What kind is that? It's a primary carbocation, primary allylic carbocation. And so I can make these two products. And notice that the what is called the 1-2 product, because relatively speaking, it added the H and the Br to carbons 1 and 2 in a 1, 2, 3, 4 numbering scheme of that conjugated diene. That 1, 2 product is what we would predict. The other product where we add to carbons 1 and 4 and the double bond moves now to between carbons 2 and 3, that is a product that we wouldn't have predicted before we realized that once I form an allylic carbocation, I can form the resonance structure, and I'm going to react both of those. And so... This is why I started out with the reaction that I did, because I could ask you, well, which one of these two products is the major product of the reaction? And again, you could say, well, this is a secondary carbocation, secondary allylic. This is the more stable intermediate, which means that this would be my major product because it came from the more stable intermediate. But then you could argue that, well, this is the more stable product. And so this is the 1,4 product in this case is the more stable product, and therefore it's the major product of the reaction. And again, what's the major product of this reaction? It's going to depend. So what is it going to depend on? It depends on the reaction conditions. So we've already seen that you could make an argument for the major product coming from the more stable intermediate or coming from the more stable product. So whichever one of these two is favored is going to depend upon the reaction conditions. So there are two types of products that we get, and these are labeled the kinetic product and the thermodynamic product. The kinetic product is the product that's formed when you have a low temperature short reaction times. That's the kinetic product. And the kinetic product means it's the first form product in the reaction. It's the one that's formed the fastest, basically. The thermodynamic product is the most stable product, and it is favored when we do the reaction at high temperatures with long reaction times. Okay, now to show you an example, here is some experimental data that if we take that exact reaction, and if we did this at minus 80 degrees, which would be a low temperature, or we did this for like, I don't know, 10 minutes, a short reaction time, we would get 80% of the 1, 2 product, 1 and 2, they switched on me, and 20% of the 1, 4 product. But if we ran the reaction under a higher temperature, sort of our high temperature conditions, and we ran this for something like 24 hours, we would get a complete reversal of the major product so that the 1,4 product would be 85% and the 1,2 product would be 15%. So depending on the reaction conditions, we can either favor the 1,2 
or the 1.4 product. And the 1.2 product came from the secondary carbocation, so this product comes from the more stable intermediate. And this product then is the more stable product. So we can see that experimentally, low temperatures, short reaction times, favor the product from the more stable intermediate, while higher temperatures, and 40 degrees compared to minus 80 is a higher temperature, long reaction times favor the formation of the product that is more stable. Okay, And so we, we're going to have to answer that question, why? Now, in this case, what we have is this is the intermediate of those reactions. And we've got the primary carbocation and the secondary carbocation. Now, remember, the true intermediate is the resonance hybrid. So the true resonance hybrid is going to have partial bonds between carbons. In this case, um, in this, case this is still carbon-1 two, three, and four. This is my original numbering scheme. So we're going to have the partial, bond, partial charges on carbons two and four and partial double bonds between two and three and three and four. Now if I asked you a question and said which one of these two carbons is going to have the greatest delta positive charge? what would you think? So when the video stops, give me an answer. Which of these two carbons would have the greatest positive charge? Carbon 2 or carbon 4? Okay, if you said carbon 2 had the greater delta positive charge, you'd be correct. Why? Because this carbon is a secondary carbon, whereas this carbon over here is a primary carbon. Now again, they're both, this is an allylic system, so these are resonance structures. But, kind, but just like we talked about with the epoxides, we would end up with, and back in first semester when we talked about the bromonium ion, this carbon with the greater delta positive charge, because it looks like a secondary carbon secondary carbocation. And you can actually see that in this diagram down here. This blue is the delta positive charge. The deeper the blue, the more delta positive. And what you can see is that the secondary carbon has far greater delta positive charge than the light blue does, which would be carbon-4. So this is carbon-4 and this is carbon-2. Okay. So we know at this point that when we add our H plus to carbon-1, we form an allylic carbocation, we get a resonance structure, and then we can add our nucleophiles to both carbocations, giving us two different products. The product from the more stable intermediate is called the kinetic product. The product that is from the more stable product, or the more stable product, is the thermodynamic product. Thermodynamic means more stable, kinetic means first formed. Okay, so now let's take a look at a really complicated, and it's not that complicated, energy coordinate diagram. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start out at my intermediate, and I'm going to start out with my intermediate being the resonance hybrid because that's really what it looks like. Now, in terms of the transition states and the activation energies, and Again, we've reversed this so that this is carbon-1, this is carbon-2, this is carbon-3, and this is carbon-4. So if we have carbon-1 and we add the H plus to it, we are going to get some positive charge on carbon-2, and we're going to get some positive charge on carbon-4. Now, because carbon-2 has the greater delta positive charge, when the Br minus comes in and adds to that carbon, 
we're going to get a lower transition state energy because that carbon has a greater delta positive charge. So you can kind of think of it this way. You know, you have a negative one charge. The greater the delta positive charge, the overall transition state is closer to being zero. And so it will have a lower energy. Whereas if there's less delta positive charge on the primary carbon, then as the Br minus comes in and adds to it, there's more, in this case, net negative charge. The, and so you're going to have a higher activation energy and a higher transition state energy. So in terms of this reaction, you could go over either one of these mountains with these two transition states en energies. So now we can apply our Arrhenius equation. Remember the Arrhenius equation says that the rate of the reaction is equal to some proportionality constant times e to the minus ea over rt. It's a logarithmic function. So which barrier is the molecule going to undergo the reaction faster? Is the reaction going to go faster over the left barrier or over the right barrier? Which one do you think? If you said that it would go over the left activation energy faster, you would be correct. Why? Lower activation energy. Rates faster when the activation energy is lower. Bigger activation energy, slower. So in this case, the reaction, the first formed product, is going to be the 1-2 product, where we add the nucleophile to the more stable carbocation. Because the more stable carbocation has more delta positive charge and a lower activation energy, a lower transition state energy. Okay. So this is what we would call the kinetic product. It's the product that's going to be formed faster. And how do we favor that product over the other product? Well, we lower the temperature, right? If it's like it's like Hammond's postulate when we talked about sort of our free radical reactions. We said that if we lower the energy that the molecule has, it will go over it'll be more selective in terms of going over that barrier. If it has just enough energy to only make it over one mountain, it's going to make it over the smaller mountain faster than the larger mountain. Right? I used a bird analogy. If you've got birds that are starving, or hikers that are starving, they're barely going to be able to make it over the small mountain. They won't be able to make it over the top mountain as fast. So in this case, we're going to get initially more kinetic product than thermodynamic product. So, okay, that makes sense. So if the reaction is short and we have a low temperature, we're going to favor forming the kinetic product because it has a lower activation energy. That's great. But how do I favor the thermodynamic product then? Well, what did I say? I said, well, we could go to high temperatures. But if I go to a high temperature, what's the best I can get out of this? Well, if I go to a high temperature, I give the molecules more kinetic energy so that they're able to do what? They're able to go over the barriers at about the same rate. So the best I could do by raising the temperatures go 50-50. Right? That was my example of hypersonic birds. The hypersonic birds are going to go over both the mountains at about equally the same rate. But in this case, that would give me a 50-50 mixture. It wouldn't favor the thermodynamic product. And we saw from the experimental data, we saw from this experimental data that if I raise the temperature, I get a majority of the more stable product. So there's something else going on here. And there is. The something else going on is once you form this product, what can happen? Well, I could break that carbon-bromine bond 
and go right back to the carbocation intermediate. So in this case, this steps, this reaction is reversible. And being a reversible reaction then, once you form the kinetic product, if you give it enough temperature and time, that kinetic product can end up going right back to the carbocation. But then you would say, but isn't the same thing still in play? It's got two barriers to overcome. So isn't it going to go over the left barrier more than the right barrier? And yes, that's true. But now let's throw in another wrinkle. And that is the stability of the products. So the product that is more stable has a lower energy than the product that is less stable. Well, so what? Well, so what is this? That in order for that reverse reaction to occur, I now have a new activation energy. I've got the reverse sort of activation energy. And over here, if I form the more stable product, in order for it to reverse itself, I'm going to have a much bigger activation energy. So now what happens? Under high temperature and long reaction times, the molecules initially start out forming the kinetic product. But then if you give them energy and time, they're going to reverse themselves. And some of them are going to go back to form the kinetic product, but some of them are going to now be able to form the thermodynamic product. Once they form the thermodynamic product, what happens? It's going to take more energy to get back over this bigger barrier to get back to the carbocation intermediate. And so if you play the temperature and time perfectly, what you can do is trap a majority of the product down Sorry, here so that it won't reverse itself and go back into the carbocation intermediate. So this is how the kinetic and thermodynamic products will play off of each other. And this is what that diagram looks like. So this is our explanation as to why the kinetic product is formed at low temperatures and short times and the, hot, and the more stable thermodynamic product in this case is favored under high temperatures and long reaction times simply because it'll allow it to reverse itself and trap a majority of the product down here where it can't get over that big barrier to get back to, to the intermediate. Okay, So we have this play in terms of the resonance or in terms of the resonance hybrid but also then these two different pathways. So when I said that it depends on the reaction conditions, it depends. Do we have a low temperature short reaction time? Do we have high temperature and long reaction times? And if we have those two conditions, we're either going to favor the kinetic product. The kinetic product comes from the most stable intermediate. And the thermodynamic product then is always the most stable intermediate or the most stable product. Okay, so that's our explanation as to how this reaction occurs. All right, let's do a problem. So let me let me show you the trick problem that I always give people that causes them um, difficulties, and it's going to be this one. So I'm going to go ahead and add HCl to that molecule. Okay, so let's draw out our mechanism by saying let's choose, I, and I always give you symmetrical dienes because if I don't, then there's going to be two different sets of products. So in this case, let's say here's carbon 1, here's carbon 2, here's carbon 3, and here's carbon 4. If you want to go from, right to, from left to right, that's fine as well. So what's going to happen is my double bond between carbon 1 and 2 is going to be used to bond the H plus to carbon 1. Now, there's the intermediate that I'm going to form. You might argue and say, wait, did you just violate Markovnikov's rule? 
Uh, Yes and no. So truly Markovnikov's rule would say you add the hydrogen to the carbon with the most hydrogens. And let's do that. And I'll show you why that's not what we're going to end up with in this case. So let's say I did add the H to this carbon, to carbon 2, and then that would form this carbocation. And you'd say, but that's a tertiary carbocation. Sure. Is it stable? Sure. But this is a secondary allylic carbocation. So if I was to add to carbon 2 and form a tertiary carbocation, that's great. But it's not as stable as being able to draw the resonance structure. And look at the resonance structure. It's tertiary as well. So which combination here is this set of carbocations more stable than this one? Sure. The only thing this one has going for it is it's a tertiary carbocation. Well, I got one of those over here. And I've got another resonance structure. So this is, the, this is what we're going to do. The thing is we always, always add the H plus. Always add the electrophile in this case to carbon 1. And carbon 1 just means 1, 2, 3, 4 of the conjugated diene system. Always add it to an end carbon of the conjugated diene. Why? Because Markovnikov's rule also can be expanded to say, I add the electrophile to form the most stable carbocation intermediate, which is going to be this pair of resonance structures. Okay, so always add the electrophile to carbon 1 to the end of the diene system because that's going to give you the most stable carbocation, which in this case are these two resonance structures. And so then what happens? Then my Cl- minus comes in and adds to this carbon. My other Cl- minus, the Cl- minus would add to this carbocation. I'm going to form... that product and I'm going to form that product. So this is my 1, 2 product. This would be my 1, 2, 3, 4. This is my 1, 4 product. Now, which one of these two products is kinetic and which one of these two products is thermodynamic? And we have to go back to the basics and say, what is the more stable intermediate here? The secondary allylic or the tertiary allylic? Well, this would be the more stable intermediate, right? And what that means is what? That means that this product is the kinetic product because the kinetic product comes from the more stable intermediate. This product over here, the 1, 2 product, has the most substituted double bond and therefore it is the thermodynamic product. So in terms of writing the mechanism and then identifying kinetic and thermodynamic products, that's what we would, that's our analysis. So then it's just simply a question of me asking you, well, what would be the major product under high temperature, long reaction times? High temperature, long reaction times would be, in this case, favoring this product, the thermodynamic product. What would be the product under low temperature, short reaction time, what would that be? That would be the kinetic product. That would be this product. And let me just 
caution you to say that sometimes the one two product is the thermodynamic product and sometimes the one two product is the kinetic product it depends on the individual molecules so there's no general rule about whether one two or one four is the kinetic or thermodynamic you have to basically do the reaction and you have to look at the reaction from scratch most stable intermediate thermodynamic or sorry most stable intermediate which in this case is the tertiary carbocation kinetic product most stable double bond is the thermodynamic product okay so you have to be careful in terms of looking at that um, molecule one two and one four are just ways to write the product they are not necessarily always kinetic or always thermodynamic it depends on the individual reactions okay so this is how we do our one two one four additions now we should probably do a ring and let's do a ring but let's go back and look at our original molecule that we used the reactions of this allylic carbocation and I asked you originally I said which one of these two products is the more is the major product you took a guess but you now know you couldn't answer that question unless I told you what the reaction conditions are and let's just identify which one of these two products is the kinetic product and which one of these two products is the thermodynamic product so for a is a the kinetic or is a the thermodynamic product why don't you go ahead and and um, answer that question when the video stops is a kinetic or is a thermodynamic well what is a a came from the least stable intermediate and A has the most substituted double bond. So this is the more stable product. A is the thermodynamic product. How about B? B came from the more stable intermediate, and so therefore B is the kinetic product. So then it would just be a question of what were the reaction conditions? High temp, long time. Low temp, short time. So we can apply kinetic and thermodynamic products to both just the reaction of an allylic carbocation, but we could also use that in our 1, 2, 1, 4 addition of these conjugated dienes. And so that's why conjugated dienes are their own separate molecules and our own separate topic, simply because they react slightly differently than if they were isolated because you get this 1,4 product that you wouldn't have predicted until you draw out the resonance structure and the, res the resonance structures of the allylic carbocation intermediates. Okay, now when I change the reactions to rings, it tends to freak people out because they're like, oh no, I have a ring, what should I do? Well. Here's a ring. Let's add now HCl to this. Okay, so what we do is we identify the four carbons in the dot in the diene one, two, three, and four. And now let's go ahead and add the H plus to carbon one. that'll leave a carbocation on carbon 2. We would then take this pair of electrons and form the resonance structure and that would give us then the plus charge there. Now we would take our Cl minus, add there, take our Cl minus, add to that carbocation. And so what is our product going to look like? 
our product's going to have the CL here with the H added there. And then down here, we're going to have, let's see, and there's two, double, two methyl groups, then the CL would be there. So this is our 1-2 product. This is our 1-4 product. Okay. So let me ask a question. Wait, for this reaction, which one of these products is the kinetic product? Which one of these two products, 1-2 one, or 1-4, one, which one is the kinetic product? So when that question comes up, go ahead and answer it. The kinetic product came from the more stable intermediate. The more stable intermediate is what? The tertiary carbocation versus the secondary carbocation. So therefore, this would be the kinetic product. And what's the thermodynamic product? It would be the 1,4 product. Why? Because it has the more stable um, double bond. Okay. So when you do a ring, it's not that much different. Now, we should write the, res the structure of the resonance hybrid here. And so the resonance hybrid in this case is going to have what? It's going to, we're going to take the average of these two resonance structures. So what we have is plus one, zero, average, delta plus. Zero, zero. So I'm averaging the charges now. I'm going back to what we did in the first week of organic one writing resonance hybrids by taking the average of the resonance structure. So charges and bonds. So 0, 0, 0. 0 plus 1, delta plus. Now notice that in terms of pattern recognition, in these structures, everywhere there's a positive charge, there will be a delta positive charge in the resonance hybrid. And then single bond, single bond, single bond. Single bond, double bond, average, partial double bond. Double bond, single bond, average, partial double bond. And notice that the partial double bonds occur between the delta positive charges. So that would be the resonance hybrid. And in any kind of mechanistic problem I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you to write all the steps. And then I'm going to ask you to tell me what the kinetic and thermodynamic products are. And then I'm also going to ask you to tell me what the resonance hybrid is to draw that out. Okay, so that is one two one four edition and kinetic and thermodynamic products. And that's the first reaction of dienes. Now I'm going to take a little a little bit of a um, sidetrack here and say let's talk about SN2 reactions of allylic halides. So in other words, if I have this as my primary allylic halide, how does it rate, if I wanted to react this with hydroxide, which one of these two reactions would go faster? The primary or the primary allylic? Which of these two would react faster with hydroxide in an SN2 mechanism? And the answer is the faster reaction would occur with the allylic halide. And you might say, why? And you know I'm going to say why. Well, let's draw out the transition state of this reaction. So the OH minus would come in, attack this carbon, kick off the bromine. We already know how to write the transition state of the primary 
halide, so let's write only the transition state here of the allylic system, right? So we've got the hydroxide, the Br, and then we have our trigonal bipyramidal transition state only in this case. We'd have, we're going to have two hydrogens, and then we're going to have the carbon of the carbon-carbon double bond. And putting in our charges for this transition state, we would have delta minus on this carbon, delta minus on this bromine. Now, in between those two minuses, this carbon right here has a delta positive charge. And we haven't really written that to date, but now it's going to be important because that carbon will have a delta positive charge on it. Well, that delta positive charge is going to be what by this double bond? The double bond and the allylic carbon now, that double bond is going to stabilize that delta positive charge. So that double bond is going to stabilize the delta positive charge. And so what does that do? Well, what that does is that basically if we have our activation energy and our transition state, it's going to lower the transition state energy and make it more stable, and therefore we will get a lower activation energy and the reaction will go faster. So allylic halides go faster in SN2 reactions than just an alkyl halide because this, the, the extra stabilization of the double bond and the special position of the allylic carbon. Okay, So that's another effect and another something special about the allylic carbon. Okay. Okay. So now let's talk about the second reaction, set of reactions for dienes. And this, these are what are called Diels-Alder reactions. And they are named after Otto Diels, who was a German organic chemist, and Kurt Alder, who was one of the first um, prominent American organic chemists. Um, just as a little bit of a context, organic chemistry was not an American science. It really developed strongly in Germany. It developed strongly in Russia as well, although, you know, those were the days of the czars and it wasn't quite clear what was going on in Russia. But people like Markovnikov and Saitsev were Russian chemists. Um, German, the whole idea of the E and Z, those are German words. Um, and so Otto Diels and Kurt Alder, I believe Kurt Alder was a student of Otto Diels, but they developed this reaction sort of independent and they both shared the Nobel Prize. And I've said before that if you can form a carbon-carbon bond, and if you did so in the 18 and 1900s, then what happened is you won a Nobel Prize and every organic student has to learn your name because you're in the textbook. And the Diels-Alder reaction is important because it not only forms two carbon-carbon bonds, it also forms a cyclohexane ring and actually a cyclohexene ring. So it turns out to be a very important reaction. And people that have studied the theoretical concepts of this, um, the Woodward-Hoffman rules, um, Woodward was for Woodward, who, if you've ever zoomed in to um, my office, you'll see there's a picture behind me of a guy with a cigarette. That's um, Robert Woodward, who is one of the preeminent synthetic chemists and theoretical chemists, organic chemists of the of the uh, night of the 20th century, um, smoked like a fiend. That's why there's always a picture of him with a cigarette in his hand. Um, but he and Rod Hoffman, who is uh, who was a theoretical chemist at Cornell, shared a Nobel Prize for understanding the orbital 
um, details of how a diels alder reaction occurs. And so this reaction has gotten a lot of people Nobel Prizes. So what happens in this case? What happens is I'm going to react a diene with what is with an alkene, but the alkene is sometimes called the dienophile, right? The diene loving. And what happens is, is we have the pair of electrons move in this direction. So what I like to do when I'm writing a Diels-Alder reaction to start with is I number the four carbons that are involved in the diene, and then I give the double bond to carbon five or six, and it doesn't matter which way you do it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this pair of electrons from the carbon-carbon double bond, the alkene, and use it to form a 1,5 single bond. Then at the same time, I'm going to take this pair of electrons in the 1, 2 double bond and move it to carbons 2 and 3. And I'm going to take the 3, 4 double bond at the same time and use that to form a 4, 6 single bond. So I'm going to form a cyclohexene where the double bond is always going to be between carbons 2 and 3 at the end. And I've now formed a carbon-carbon single bond between 1 and 5 and 4 and 6. So I formed two carbon-carbon bonds and a cyclohexene ring. And then what I usually do is then I look at what groups are attached to what position and I fill in around that. So that's a Diels-Alder reaction. That's the basics of a Diels-Alder reaction. So looking at that reaction, here's actually what happens. So here's what happens in that reaction. If you can think about the diene kind of looking like this, with its, S with its sp2 hybridization and its parallel p orbitals. And then you have the alkene down here, which kind of looks like that, with its orbitals of, the, of its pi bond. What happens is, is that carbon 1 and carbon 4 are perfectly spaced so that the diene can either plop down on top of the double bond, or the double bond can plop down on top of the diene so that I end up forming those bonds. I overlap those p orbitals. And then everything else, the electrons move around so that when I form my final cyclohexene, I end up with my pi bond there. So that's seen in this kind of a picture where we take these where we take these alkene p orbitals and we can overlap them with the orbitals of carbons 1 and 4 in the diene. And so they will overlap to form the carbon-carbon bond, the two carbon-carbon bonds. Okay. okay, there are some rules. And we're going to deal with two of these rules, and then we'll deal with the third one at the beginning of the next lecture video. So the first rule is that the diene must be in the S cis conformation. What does that mean? Here's what that means. In terms of the S cis conformation, here is one conformation because I have free rotation around that sigma bond, around that single bond. This is called the S, and S stands for sigma. This is the S cis, this is the S trans conformation. Now, the S trans is far more stable, but in order for a Diels-Alder reaction to occur, you've got to get it in the one in the S cis conformation because that's the only way that the orbit that the carbons one and four are going to be in perfect distance to overlap with carbons 
five and six of the double bond. And so it has to be S cis, not S trans. Okay, so that's the first rule is the diene must be in the S cis conformation, which means it has to look like that. Okay, and then the stereochemistry of the alkene is preserved in the final product, whether the alkene is cis or trans. So in this case, let's say, so in this case, let's say that I have this, alke uh, this diene, and I'm going to react it with this alkene. And when I do that, I'm going to end up with carbons 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, and 6. So in terms of writing the products, I write a cyclohexane ring, carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, 4, and then 5 and 6. What was attached to carbons 2 and 3? Methyl groups. The double bond, the pair of electrons move like this. So the double bond ends up between carbons 2 and 3. And what I mean by the stereochemistry of the product, if this alkene is a cis alkene, then that means over here that those two CN groups, C triple bond N groups, that means that the stereochemistry there is also cis. So the stereochemistry is preserved. And why is that? Well, the reason it is is because if I go back and I again draw out my picture of my cis, my S cis diene reacting with my alkene, because this is a concerted, meaning one step mechanism, and these bonds form and the diene plops down on top of the double bond or vice versa, what happens is, is that there's no way for those groups that start out to be cis for the double bond to rotate around so that all of a sudden it becomes trans over here. So that concerted mechanism forces whatever the stereochemistry is here to be preserved in the product. So if this reaction had the cis alkene, you would form the cis product. Now, if I did that same reaction with now the trans alkene, then the product that I would make, right, so again, carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, 1, two, three, four, carbons five and six. So off two and three are methyl groups. Double bond goes between carbons two and three. Now because the CN groups were trans, I would end up having those CN groups trans in the final product. And I should say it doesn't matter up here as long as these two groups are cis. It doesn't matter whether they're both on a bold wedge or a dashed wedge. Same thing's true down here. As long as it's a bold and a dashed wedge because it came from the trans alkene, then you have the correct product. Now, at this point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out something that is sometimes a point of confusion. And if you're one of those people that is like, oh no, don't tell me, don't tell me something that's a point of confusion because then you're going to confuse me. Then just stop the video right now. Okay, so you're here. In rule number two, or sorry, in rule number one, it said that the diene must be in the S cis conformation. That means that this double bond, this diene has to be S cis. 
Sometimes people confuse the alkene cistrans with the diene S cis. And so when I give them this product, they, they write down no reaction. And I'll say, why isn't there any reaction? They'll say, because you said it had to be cis. I said, the alkene has to be S cis. The diene has to be S cis. The alkene can be cis or trans. Whatever it is, that's what the final product's going to be. So make sure that you're clear on the difference between rule number one, that the diene has to be S cis, versus the alkene being either cis or trans. Whatever that stereochemistry is in the double bond, that's what gets preserved in the product. Okay? So those are rules number one and two for writing the products of diels alder reactions. At the beginning of the next lecture video, we're going to talk about rule number three, which is when we react a cyclic diene with a substituted alkene. What happens there? Okay? So we talked about one, two, one, four. Resonance structures for allylic carbocations, allylic, ra allylic radicals and started diels alder reactions. So in the next lecture video, we're going to finish up our reactions of double bonds, dienes, and then we're going to move on to the ultimate conjugated system, the benzene ring.